Thank you. Thank you, Diaz, and, and thank everybody for having me. It's, uh, it's a blessing and a pleasure to be here today. My name's Don, and I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> and, uh, you know, speakers always say that we're grateful to be wherever we are, and we are. But with me, and I expect most of us, it, it's not just a courtesy. I'm, I'm grateful because I'm not apt to take a drink on a day when I've got an obligation to talk to a bunch of wonderful folks in Alcoholics Anonymous. And, it, and I've been blessed with, with knowing, no, I've been blessed better than that. I've been knowing with realizing. Uh, in sobriety, words have, have, have become very important to me because I, I've noticed that things tend to become what I call them. And all my life I had used to know and to realize interchangeably with one another something, uh, with one another. You know, if I knew something, I'd say I realize that. Um, and it finally occurred to me several years ago that the word realize is a form of the word real. And when I realize something, it has become real inside me, and that's so different from just knowing it. The things that I've known for 25 or 30 years that I had not realized. So what I'm getting at is that God has been kind enough to me to let me realize that I really am only sober a day at a time. By the grace of God, my sobriety date's April the 9th of 1981. And I can remember in early sobriety, I would sit around and listen to some old fool that had been sober so long, been dry so long, he was a fire hazard, you know, and... Um, and, and I'd hear him say things like, I'm a drink away from a drunk, and I'm just, you know, it's just one day at a time, and I think, yeah, sure, you know, sure, you still, still in that spot. And I went through several years in sobriety when, uh, if you had asked me, Don, will you die drunk or sober, I would have given you the absolutely politically correct AA response. And I believe I would have passed a lie detector test. I would have told you why. Everybody's just sober a day at a time. None of us know. But there was a part of me that had become unable to visualize me dying drunk. There was a part of me down in there somewhere that it wasn't real. I knew it, but I didn't realize it. And nothing happened, no event that I know of, nothing to tie it to. But I guess about 10, 12 years ago, God just gradually changed that for me, and I'm grateful for that, because that makes every day of sobriety more precious, because I do know that I'm sober today. i tell you what else I know, and I'm, I'm going to be talking to you about 6 and 7, but I'm going to mention a little something about 10, 11, and 12 before I start on that. You know, I read this big book uh, kind of selectively, and when I say kind of selectively, you know, it's hard to learn much when you already know what something says. You know, real hard. Kind of like it's hard. To, then the instructions don't do you much good when you think you're smarter than the people who made the instructions. And and I, I've always had an awful lot of problem with things like that. And uh, and I can read this big book and I can know the words exactly. And then all of a sudden, somewhere down the line, I begin to realize, it becomes real to me that those words mean something entirely different than what I thought they meant, than what I knew they meant. You know, I've stumbled through here for years believing that this book tells me that my daily reprieve is contingent on my spiritual condition. And i got to tell you, that was scary. That was scary because I still wake up some days and by my judgment, which isn't any good on anything anyway, at least I do know that, but by my judgment, my spiritual condition is not very good. You know, I get scared, I get feeling like I'm walled off from you, I'm walled off from God, my brain gets to spinning. Some mornings it seems like I can't remember the last word I just tried to pray, and I look at my meditation books and can't remember the last word I just looked at. Um, and during the years when I thought that my daily reprieve was contingent on my spiritual condition, that scared me to death. Because I figured a fellow out here walking around in the spiritual condition I thought I was in on days like that was just apt to get struck drunk. Uh, 
And I'm so grateful that I realize now that that book means what it said when it says that my daily reprieve is contingent on the maintenance of my spiritual condition. And let me tell you what that did for me instantly. If I had driven down here instead of flying, I would have a car out there. And that car would have a condition. Okay? Now, there's nothing I can do to change the condition of a car instantaneously. Whatever that condition is, it just is. On the other hand, there's a process of maintaining an automobile. And that is all action over which I can exercise 100% control. So you see, I don't get my daily reprieve based on how I am. I get my daily reprieve based on what I do every day. I can wake up and not feel like getting on my knees, not have time to get on my knees, not want to get on my knees, but make myself get on those knees anyway. I can look at those meditation books when I'm so scattered I can't remember a single word. I can go in my office and be so self-absorbed and so busy with important things that I clearly don't have time to talk to old Joe who's calling for the eighth time in the last three days to talk about the girl. You know, and but but when Joe calls and they tell me Joe's on the phone, instead of saying, you tell Joe I'll have to call him back later, I can say, put him through. And I can pray to myself, that will be done. I'm no longer running the show. Lord, please let me seek to love, comfort, and understand Joe rather than to be loved, comforted, and understood. And I'd pick up that phone and say, good morning, Joe. How are you this morning, buddy? What can I do for you? And I can keep praying those 11th step prayers, which do, the 11th step prayers do a lot of miracles for me. And the one that I'm needing there is a big miracle they do, do for me is they make me something that I am not by nature. By nature, I am not a listener. Without divine intervention, it's just automatic. I can't help it. My brain will be running on another track while you're talking, and one of those tracks will be, what am I going to say next? But if I'll truly pray those 11th step prayers before I talk to you, of that will be done, I'm no longer running the show. And Lord, please let me seek to love, comfort, and understand you rather than to be loved, comforted, and understood by you. It'll make a listener out of me. And when I do what Chuck C. says, you know, Chuck Chamberlain said that uh, whatever I give my interest, attention, and love to, becomes the most interesting thing in the world. And when I pray those prayers and I'll give my interest, attention, and love to what you or old Joe calling about the girl wants to talk to me about, that becomes for that time and place the most interesting thing in the world to me. Now there's a noon meeting every weekday close to my office and I've been there an awful lot in my life and I know everybody that goes there. Uh, I've heard everything that they've got to say Ad nauseum, I have heard everything they've got to say. I don't hear very well. Now, the, the acoustics are terrible in there, so I only hear about 20% of what is said. So on that busy day when my spiritual condition is just feeling like crap, I can decide not to go there, but I also can decide to go. And I can make myself go on to that stupid old meeting of where I know there's no way in this world I'll get anything out of it. And I go through the rest of the day like that, and I believe that I am absolutely guaranteed that I will not pick up drink that day. So you see, it went from, my daily reprieve went from something being on a daily basis outside my control to something being within my control on a daily basis. I believe this book promises me that on the days that I do the work to maintain my spiritual condition, that I'm not going to drink on that day. There's a flip side of that coin. The flip side of that coin is I can wake up feeling like I am just absolutely so joined with God and so centered that we might just clasp hands and go out drifting through the universe and merge with the tower or something. You know, when I am so centered, it's just, it's just you know, I'm beatific. And, and when it comes time to get out on my knees, I can decide why. That would be redundant. My whole life is a prayer. 
I can go on into that office and when Joe calls, I can say, oh, I have the greatest and deepest love for Joe, but I'm currently contemplating this spiritual principle that's just about to raise me to an even more exalted spiritual level, so we'll have to deal with Joe later. I can engage in deeper spiritual pursuits instead of going to that stupid meeting where I've heard what everybody's got to say but I can't hear anyway and I don't want to go. And on that day, I believe I'm subject to get just drunker and coup de brown. That's the flip side of it. Whether I drink or not isn't based on how I feel today and what I think my spiritual condition is, is what I do today. And I'm relating that back to my gratitude for being here because there may be a day when I take a drink. I know that. But I don't believe it's going to be on a day when some sweet folks have asked me to do what you folks have asked me to do today. So thank you for letting me be here. And now we'll uh, move a little bit into talking about what I'm supposed to be talking about, and that's step six and seven. Um, and I'm not going to not gonna give you much of my story at all. I'm, I'm scheduled to tell that on Sunday morning, but uh, I will tell you that I did not get here because alcohol gave me the hiccups. Uh, 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 alcohol was the center of my life for 25 years. Alcohol took just about everything but my physical life from me. I know I was in an asylum one time. A friend of mine, out of pure compassion, came to see me. It was probably about my 12th asylum. And uh, uh, I was talking to him about committing suicide. And he said, Don, why? He said, you've committed social suicide. You've committed professional suicide. You've committed economic suicide. You've committed domestic suicide. Why bother? You know, you've already done that. Uh, so I, I, I did have a, a, a rough go with it. I do want to tell you that one of, one of the reasons that I had the difficulty getting sober that I did was uh, a real problem that I had with the higher power concept. Um, Anytime anybody mentioned God, it, it made the little hairs stand up on the back of my neck. It, it insulted my intellect, really, that you religious fanatics would talk about such claptrap, you know, in a fun fellow like myself. And using higher power didn't fool me a bit. I knew just exactly what you were talking about. And it would still make the hairs stand up on my neck and run me away from you religious fanatics. And... And I'm one of the ones who, who has been so blessed because I was allowed to live long enough for alcohol to keep running me back here because I didn't have anywhere else to go until finally the miracle happened and I was able to take that hand that you guys had been extending to me and let you lead me through these 12 steps that are our only program of recovery. And those 12 steps led me to, uh, to a loving God that I didn't even know was there for me. And that's the reason I'm alive today. I will tell you before we start in on 6 and 7 specifically that I believe what I just said with all my heart, that there is no other program of recovery other than the 12 steps. In fact, I was taught and I believe that there's no other program of Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, I can be a member of the fellowship on any day I've got a desire to stop drinking. I don't even have to go to meetings. You know, as long as day I've got a desire to stop drinking and want to call myself a member of the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous, I can do that. And thank goodness the requirements are no higher than that. That let me hang around until the miracles really began to happen. But there's a whole lot of difference in being in the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous and being in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, the part that we read uh, from Chapter 5 and that we call how it works at meetings uh, says, here are the steps we took that are suggested as a program of recovery. And I was told in very early sobriety to look through that first 164 pages and find something else that was referred to as a program or a program for recovery. And I'll save you the trouble. I did. It's not in there. So the only thing that's called the program in that big book are steps 1 through 12. And I believe a lot of things about them. I believe they are the prescription for alcoholism. Uh, no other prescription has ever worked for me. I think it's contrary to the entire, entire principle of this big book to claim that Alcoholics Anonymous is the only way for somebody to get sober. Um, that would be controversial. That would be arrogant. Uh, and I think it's just absolutely uh, against the principles of the book to claim that. But I will tell you that absolutely nothing else has worked for me. 
and I know hundreds, probably even thousands of other folks for whom absolutely nothing else has worked except the 12 steps. When I say they're the prescription for sobriety, I mean this. If I've got an infection that's going to kill me, but that infection will respond to penicillin, I don't need to understand all the ins and outs of this infection, how those little bacteria can can make such terrible things wrong with magnificent me. I don't need to understand one single thing about how penicillin works in the human body. I don't even need to believe that that little bottle of pills can take care of everything that's wrong with me. And here's the kicker. I don't even need to want to take the pills. If I've got the infection and I take the pills as directed, and when they explain that to me, they kind of verbally underscored as directed, I'll get just fine, thank you. And I believe these steps work on alcoholism precisely the same way. Uh, I was told some things about the steps, such as if you weren't supposed to do them in order, they wouldn't have been numbered. Uh, I, it was explained to me that they were called the steps rather than the 12 principles, the 12 propositions, the 12 tenets. You know, you could call them any, any number of things. That they weren't called the steps by accident because in a conventional staircase, the second step in that staircase actually must have the first step in that staircase to serve as its base. It rests on it and so on up the staircase. So <clears throat> I believe that with all my heart. I also believe that when we're going through the first nine steps, we need to stay where we are. Can't tell you how many times I've had sponsees say, Oh, Don, I'm trying to work on this fourth step. Man, I can't do this. I don't know how I'll ever make amends to those people. I think, you, son, you may get drunk or get run over by a truck. You're five steps ahead of yourself. You know, stay where you are because, you see, uh, a little story that I love, uh, it, it's a lot like me, and I, I think maybe it's a lot like a lot of uh, us alcoholics. About an alcoholic that had a flat tire out on an old, dark, deserted road and didn't have a spare. Well, the alcoholic looks everywhere and first doesn't see anything, then he or she sees a little pinpoint of light way down the road. So the alcoholic starts walking toward the light and the committee and the alcoholic's head goes to work. And says, what if that's not even a house? Uh, you know, walk all the way and it's not a house. And he gets where he sees his house. Well, what if it's a house and there's nobody at home? Well, what if there's somebody home but they won't answer the door this time of night? What if they're home and they answer the door and they don't have a jack? Well, if they're home, they answer the door and they got a jack and they won't let me borrow it. <laughs> well, if they're home, they got a jack and they let me borrow it and I walk all the way back to this car and it won't fit. <laughs> and about this time, the alcoholic's knocking on the door. Old farmer comes to the door and after a minute says, Can I help you? The alcoholic says, I didn't want to borrow your damn jack anyway. <laughs> uh, So that's probably a, a good reason to stay where we are when we're going through the first nine steps, which I was taught are the entire program for recovery. I was taught that when we have done the first nine steps, if we've done them the way the book says, we should be in a state of recovery. We should at that point be a recovered alcoholic. When I got sober, it doesn't seem to be such a big deal now, but when I got sober, man, you had to say you were a recovering alcoholic. It just seemed like it sounded terribly arrogant and so on if you called yourself a recovered alcoholic. I called myself a recovering alcoholic in front of my old sponsor one time, and he said, Don, that's fine. said, just be aware that the book refers to recovered alcoholics. And by that time, I'd been sober, you know, probably five or six weeks, and I had become quite a big book scholar. So... <laughs> So his name was Cherry, Cherry Carpenter. So I said, well, Cherry, where did they hide that in the big book? And he said, well, the first place they hid it, Don, was in the subtitle of the book. I didn't even know the book had a sub subtitle. Of course, the subtitle is how many thousands of men and women have recovered from alcoholism. And then he said, then they hid it twice more in the first paragraph to the foreword to the first edition. 
when they said that more with more than a hundred men and women who have recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body, and that the purpose of this book is to show others precisely how we have recovered. He also stopped at that point, pointed out that it did not say that the purpose of this book is to share with others the philosophical truths that somehow transported us to a sublime state of sobriety, but rather to show others the specific actions that we took which enabled us to reach a state of recovery. Uh, Cherry also told me that uh, you only do the first nine steps one time. Now that sounds a little shocking when you first hear it, but then when you realize that 10, 11, and 12 contain absolutely everything that's in one through nine. For instance, part of my morning meditation is that I read the third step prayer, I read the uh, seventh step prayer, uh, and I read a lot that the book has to say about the 11th step. But when I read that third step prayer, in my mind, because of the way I'm sponsored, I'm not redoing my third step, I'm doing 11th step work. That's part of my, part of my process of seeking to improve my conscious contact. Same with the seventh step, I'm doing 11th step. In my sobriety, I've done all eight or 10 inventories that look just exactly like a fourth step and follow the big book pages 64 through 70 exactly. But in my mind, they have not been fourth steps. They have been tenth step of continuing to take personal inventory. Took me about five years sober to figure out why Cherry made those distinctions. And, and he didn't get on soapboxes. That wasn't something that he beat me over the head with. He just wanted me to know that. When I was about five years sober, I realized why he was doing that. He knew who he was dealing with. He knew that if he let me be a poor little crippled alcoholic that wasn't like those earth people out there, and had to be baby at all time, you know, that 15 years sober, I'd be sitting around the clubhouse playing euchre all day, whining about earth people and how I had to take care of myself. He wanted me to understand that if I'm an alcoholic and that's what's wrong with me and that's all that's wrong with me, and I've done those first nine steps the way the book says, and then I'm living on 10, 11, and 12 every day, I ought to be as well equipped emotionally, spiritually, and mentally to deal with this world on this world's terms as a person who never had alcoholism. So that, and also if he didn't want me thinking of myself as forever recovering, forever mired down in a process with no end. You know, he wanted me to see that I could get to the point where I was okay as long as I continued to do 10, 11, and 12, and the other things that I needed to do to stay okay. Uh, <coughs> okay. I got sober in Nashville, Tennessee. I had lived on the street for about a year and a half before I got sober. I had lost my law license. I had lost everything in my life. I had lost some bodily functions. Thought I was going to die of alcoholism, drug addiction. Everybody I've ever talked to who knew me or knew, my, knew of me during that period thought I was going to, too. When I was 18 years sober, I found out that 15 years before then, when I was three years sober, uh, remember, I didn't find it out until 15 years after it was said that that same sponsor that I was talking about, Cherry, had told this to a fellow, a fellow that he and I both knew just absolutely could not stay sober, and had come in to him and said, well, I've been on another drunk, and I know I'm hopeless, I know I'm way too egotistical, I know I'm incapable of being rigorously honest with myself, and I know I've got grave emotional mental disorders other than the alcoholism, but if you'll try to sponsor me, I'll try one more time to get sober. And Cherry looked at him, put a little chew of tobacco in his mouth, and said, Jim, let me tell you something. He said, if Don Major can get sober, anybody in the world can get sober. <laughs> and I've never known whether Jerry was con Cherry was complimenting me or insulting me, but uh, at any rate, that's what he said. So I was in bad shape. The miracle happened. Uh, I got sober uh, April 9th, 1981, or stopped drinking. My last drink was April the 8th and uh, threw myself into the fellowship and miracles that I'll talk about Sunday morning happened and uh, celebrated a year sober living in an attic in Nashville with no phone, no car, teeth finishing rotten and out of my head, was never able to get employed, uh, happier than I'd ever been in my life. Uh, at about a year and a half sober my law license got put back in order as a pure, pure side effect of doing steps 8 and 9. I'm absolutely convinced that if it had been my objective to get my law license back, I not only would never have gotten them back, I would have died of alcoholism. Uh, 
but when I really and truly was able to act like a person would act, who was concerned only with doing what the book says with eight and nine rather than trying to fix me, then the miracle began to happen. See, I can't get saintly enough to feel like that. But I found out that doesn't count. It doesn't make a bit of difference. As long as I will do the right action in the right way, my feelings and my intentions will all straighten out later. But if I fall back into that pit that's nearly killed me so many times, my it's nearly killed me sober. Falling back in that pit of, we got to do something to make me feel like doing right so I can do right. I'm back in the pit. I want to tell you, sober. See, that's so ingrained in me that if I wake up in the morning and don't feel like doing what I need to do, let's say going to work, don't feel like doing the right thing, every fiber of my being wants to do something like call one of y'all up and aggravate you. I don't feel like going to work. What can we do to make me feel like going to work so I can go to work? What difference does it make? i got to go to work. What difference does it make whether I feel like going to work? But see, my mind doesn't work that way. And, and over the years, I have worried sponsors to distraction. I have dominated discussion meetings. I have prayed until I was blue in the face. I've even spent probably a few thousand dollars on outside counseling trying to make me feel like doing right so I do right. See, I've got this insane thing. Man, my base trouble, you know, the book says that, that, that selfishness, self-centeredness is the root of our troubles. What my sponsor says, that means the first thing wrong with me is I've got an ego disorder. And everything else flows from that. And on account of that ego disorder of mine, there's something down in the middle of that thing that is absolutely convinced that what I think, feel, and believe is the center of the universe. My Lord, we can't have little Donnie doing something he doesn't feel like doing. Among other things, it make him a hypocrite. And you know, we alcoholics are peculiar about being a hypocrite. Now, if we've been sober a while and done our steps, we do it tastely and subtly and in a spiritual manner, but, but we can get a little, uh, little chuckle or, or smile out of past larceny and adultery and things like that. And if a homicide is far enough away and enough removed, we can get a real tasteful little lifting of the corner of the mouth out, out of that. But my God, we don't want to be hypocrites. It'd just be awful. Uh, <laughs> so. At any rate, my bottom line is, all that praying, all that outside counseling, worrying people in the program to death, I've never had anything do any good toward making me feel like doing right, except doing right when I don't feel like it. And I just hate that. I mean, I wish I didn't have to give you that news, but the only thing that ever makes me feel like doing right when I don't feel like doing right is go ahead and doing right. And if I keep waiting to change it, it won't work. But at any rate, I worked on through my um, through through my first nine steps in Nashville, and law license got put back in order, and I went back to Louisville when I was 21 months sober, and uh, moved back up there with everything I owned in the front seat of a 10-year-old barred car. Uh, hadn't seen my only child, seen or talked to my only child in over three years. Um, the, my former law partners out of just pure compassion. Uh, they didn't want me anywhere around them, but they paid uh, 30 days rent on an office, a safe two blocks from them on a little office for me to be there, and 30 days rent on a furnished room. I went back and miracles just started happening everywhere. Uh, the second month I was there by God incidents, I talked at the Kentucky State Convention in front of 2,000 people, and I thought that was bad, but I, I said earlier that my judgment of events in my life is just almost always wrong. You know, if I think it has no redeeming characteristic whatsoever, if I'll not drink and keep on stumbling in the right direction, it will wind up the foundation of some of the most beautiful things in my life. On the other hand, if when I first see it coming, I think it's the greatest thing since sliced bread, it's probably getting ready to try to kill me. You know, I, I, I need to not put a whole lot of store in my judgment on events in my life. But, but that wound up being a real positive event, talking at that conference. People started asking me to sponsor them. They started saying, Don, you say good things. Uh, people started asking me to speak all different places. And I started out very early in sobriety talking, you know, a good bit around the country. My law practice started doing fairly well to start with. Uh, and first thing you know, I was driving a decent car and I had decent clothes. My daughter, 
uh, the same month that I talked at that conference. I saw her for the first time two months later. She moved in with me and lived with me all through high school and uh, and, and and we're dear friends today. She uh, gave me my first blood grandchild back in April, and they were down last weekend. And she's been in Al Nine twenty years, and and we just and we also get on one another's nerves to the point we break the other one out in half. You know, I don't want to paint this idealistic, unrealistic picture, but we sure do love one another, uh, and it sure is a whole lot better than what I had. And all those things are rolling along. They were rolling along till I was about nine years sober. And by that time, and I'm not saying this, but please don't misunderstand, I'm just giving you a picture of where I was. I was sponsoring between 40 and 50 guys, and I was, I was regularly talking all over the country. You know, probably at that time I was traveling 12, 15 weekends a year. Um, and I was dying. I was absolutely dying inside. And the main reason was that financial chaos and relationships with the opposite sex were absolutely killing me. And Lord, I was trying so hard. I really was. I was trying to use rigorous honesty, prayer, sponsors, meetings. You know, I was trying to use all the best tools in the world to try to get things straightened out, and I, and I couldn't. And I didn't know what was wrong. Now, it may shock you, but... I actually have the capacity to get a little Ted grandiose from time to time. <laughs> and I can remember thinking that I was kind of like Moses in the Promised Land. That, that what God had really done, he had let me have all these wonderful things that had happened to me in sobriety, but he had brought me where I could see a world where people had sanity and peace in their economic and relationship lives and let me look down into that valley and then said, Don, you didn't really think I was going to let you get away with everything, did you? Said, you can't ever have any of that. That's your burden. That's your cross for what you've done. And that actually went through my mind because I didn't know what to do. Something happened in May of night. Well, and, and I'll tell you a little bit about the, the chaos. The chaos was just awful. I, I got sober owing a whole bunch of money. And, of course, when my daughter moved in with me, there were expenses there. And... And I was surviving, as I say, I was living in a decent place, driving a decent car, wearing nice clothes and doing what I had to do, but the old debt just rolled and rolled. My finances when I got sober were such that when I was three and a half years sober, my sponsor and my lawyer and I got together and decided that my finances had improved to the point where I could file a Chapter 11 bankruptcy without getting indicted. And it took me three and a half years sober to work up to filing a bankruptcy with a plan to pay back every penny. And it was such a mess that there were five years of litigation after I filed it before a plan got approved for me to start paying. So things were financially a mess. I couldn't have bought when I was, when I was nine years sober. Uh, I had a credit card. Because by that time, my daughter had started college, and they gave her an American Express credit card, and I had a family member American Express credit card for my daughter. On my own, I couldn't, I couldn't have bought a, a, a loaf of bread. The relationship thing, Lord. Uh, they say you stop maturing emotionally when you start drinking alcoholically. If that's true, I started drinking alcoholically when I was 12 or 13. And, and uh, as I began to get sober, some, some lady who didn't have two heads, you know, looked all right, would pay a little attention to me. And, and I want to tell you, when I swore undying love to her, I couldn't have been more sincere. Couldn't have meant it more. You know, two or three weeks later, oh my God, if I don't get away from this woman, I'm going to die, you know. And that went on, and I wound up with, with two uh, bad marriages in sobriety. It wasn't not bad necessarily. The, the, the first marriage, I wanted so hard to do the right thing that I got to thinking about that maybe what I'd been doing wrong was having sex with these women before I married them. That maybe it was defiling the marital relationship. I did that and they got me a list. I think I had 42 things on it. 
of what I needed. Couldn't be a vegetarian, didn't want anybody that was that militant about their food. You know, had a lot of things like that. Just just the things that I wanted uh, in a woman. Had my checklist with 42 things on it. This poor child wanders by who seemed to fit them all. So I married her. And, uh, and and we stayed married for a little over a year, and I had to say, you know, I've made a terrible mistake. And uh, and then the last, the, then the other marriage before that nine years was a lady I met at car wash. Um, I had a new expensive car with, uh, with with temporary tag on it. She was quite a bit younger than I am, and. Uh, we started talking, had lunch, and somewhere along the line she followed me home and didn't leave. Uh, and, and and that one resulted in a five-month marriage and a 22-month divorce, and also my son, who is 15 years old now. And uh, and that's all worked out fine. My son and I are really great friends, and, uh, and I am able to deal with her as I need to. So it worked out. But, but you see what a mess things were. Well, May of 1990, I wound up going to uh, Cleveland because Cherry, my sponsor in Nashville, had died. And I'd asked Tom B. from up there in Avon Lake right outside of Cleveland to be uh, a sponsor. And uh, I flew up on a week. It was a funny thing. I'd asked Tom to do that, and then a couple of weeks later I saw Big Ed in the paper. Continental Airline had like $52 round trip from Louisville to Cleveland. Flew up there, and there was an AA golf tournament up there. It was an, a, an Aquin Cleveland AA golf tournament. I don't play golf, but Tom does. And uh, um, got up there, and I want to tell you there was some there was some people up there with a lot of sobriety. At the time, Tom had 29 years, and they treated him like a newcomer. There was one old boy there that weekend who had drank with Dr. Bob. Well, these guys didn't get me out of there. And Tom had told them, said, you know, this is really going to be a hoot. I've got this clown that's a hotshot circuit speaker and all this, and the little idiot's dying inside. So, you know, he's coming up here with his butt on fire, except for sure Tom didn't say it like that. He's too kind and too spiritual. But that would have been the gist of it. Uh, I didn't get out of the airport before one of those old guys said, oh, sober about nine or ten years. That's about the time that most folks begin to look at steps six and seven. And I can remember thinking, well, you don't know who you're talking about, or you know or who you're talking to. You know, by that time, I'd listened to probably close to a hundred fifth steps, uh, and so on. Um, and and let me say this: sometimes I say that and forget to qualify it. What that guy was saying was not that we can't comprehend six and seven, and that we can't do them right until we've been sober nine or ten years. What he was saying was that when most of us blow past it and don't realize what it really means, that it takes about nine or ten years for us to run into the brick wall. So, you know, don't get the impression that we can't approach it right earlier in sobriety. We certainly can. That's just when the brick wall seems to jump up out of the ground if you haven't approached it uh, right. Um, and let me say something else about this weekend, that weekend, May of 1990. Uh, that weekend is truly a burning bush in my life, okay? And I want to talk just a minute about burning bushes because I believe that I believe that God has let me realize something really important about burning bushes. I have never seen a clearly flaming bush already bursting into total flames. And I don't have any matches to light a burning bush. But what I have got is a set of bellows where I can fan the fire when I see a spark on that bush. What I'm getting down to is that my real awakenings, my burning bushes, my epiphanies from a religious standpoint are pretty well the ones that I have decided were that. And let me tell you how that came to me. We all know the story about Bill Wilson when he was shaking out the last drunk in the hospital room and he saw something. He saw something. And it's clear when you read that that Bill didn't have a clue what he'd seen. Didn't have a clue. Doctor came in the next morning, told the doctor about it, and the way it sounds, it may have been kind of a passing conversation. And the doctor said, I don't know either, Bill. 
But if I were you, I would hold on to it and build it. And that's the reason we're sitting here today, guys. That's the reason there is an Alcoholic Anonymous. Because Bill Wilson, instead of deciding, well, that was just part of withdrawal, some synapses in the brain, you know, some circuits short circuiting, and Bill said, yes, I'm going to hold on to that. I'm going to let that be a turning point in my life. And Bill got out those bellows and started fanning the flames of that burning bush, and that's why we're here today. So, and the reason I'm saying that's particularly about this, I've often wondered that if when I was flying back from Cleveland that weekend, if somebody on the airplane had said, Don, what has happened to you significant this weekend? I don't know whether I would have said, oh, I've got a new view of step six and seven or not. I really don't. But I do know that events that happened and what I was able, by God's grace, to hold on to and live, uh, uh, that six and seven are, are what happened that weekend. They are what happened that weekend. It changed my life. Uh, what had happened, I had done my fourth and fifth step in Nashville, and I had formed a picture of what a spiritual dawn ought to look like. I think we all do if we do our fourth and fifth steps. And uh, I did what the book says. You know, we don't have, I, I don't find anything else in the book where we are so specifically advised precisely what to do as we are advised on pages 75 and 76 about what we do when, our, when we finish our fifth step and go home and do the sixth and seventh step. You know, it tells us we go home, tells us where to go, says we take one hour, tells us how long to take, tells us we get the big book down from the shelf and we review those first five proposals, the first five steps, make sure we haven't skimped on anything. And then we move on to the top of page 76 where we find every word that the big book has got to say about six and seven. It's a little bit less than a half a page. Two paragraphs on top of page 76. Well, I did that and by that time, when I did that, it was real clear to me what six and seven were. Six and seven were where, with God's help, I had gotten that far. I went to work on me to make me into what I had decided a spiritual dawn ought to look like. Now, let me assure you that this spiritual dawn I had in my head didn't have any of the character defects left that were making myself centered but uncomfortable and embarrassing me. So I spent the next roughly eight years after I did that, it was somewhere around a year sober that I was doing that. I spent roughly the next eight years praying for God to get rid of those character defects that were making me uncomfortable, were embarrassing me, that I thought were impeding my spiritual growth, that I thought were inconsistent with who I ought to be. And I prayed on that, I'm sure, every day of my life for those eight years. And I know now that I might as well have been praying for a bright red Ferrari. Because you see, when I'm praying for a character defect to be gone because I want it gone, because it's inconsistent with who I think I ought to be, and particularly if it's making me uncomfortable, I'm praying for my own selfish ends. And the book tells me that it won't work. You can easily see why. Well, it took me eight years of it to easily see why. You see, I could have quoted the seventh step prayer backwards at that time. I could have sat down at a table with you, and if you'd given me five minutes, I would have been able to start at the last word of the seventh step prayer and work backwards back up to the first word. So I certainly knew what the seventh step prayer said, but I didn't realize it. I guess it just, that selective reading of the big book, I, I guess I just didn't feel, didn't realize that it meant what it said. That prayer doesn't ask God to remove all my defects of character. And it certainly does not ask God to remove the ones that are making my self-centered but uncomfortable. Let me say something on that. You know, one of the big principles of this book is to not be controversial, and I love that principle, and I try to live my life for that principle. Uh, I'll give you an example. Bill Wilson doesn't call alcoholism a disease in the first 164 pages of this book. Uh, I was reminded of that by a taper in Arkansas. Uh, uh, gee, I don't know whether you ever knew them or not, Lee, uh, but uh, I was reminded of that after a, a very 
clearly reminded. Uh, he said, I got to get me one of those GD. Uh, he had not yet uh, decided that spiritual, that profanity was not a sign of spiritual growth. Said he had to get him one of those GD Louisville big books. And I thought, of course, I'd open some door for him where we was going to change his life and everything was going to be great. Old Robert. And he said, yeah, I got to get me one of them GD big books that calls alcoholism a disease because I had, I had called it a disease. Well, I got to think about that. Bill Wilson certainly believed alcoholism was a disease, as do I. But Bill Wilson conveyed every word that he needed to convey, every thought, without using that word. He called it a malady. He called it an illness. He called it a disorder. He lost absolutely nothing in terms of the points that he wanted to make. And yet he was able to do it without stirring up the controversy and turning some people off to the whole program because of a disagreement on that point. So I try to be that way. So where I'm going is this. I understand why people say that Alcoholics Anonymous is a selfish program. I understand the point they're trying to make, and it's a valid point. The point they're trying to make is that if we don't keep ourselves, you know, if we don't do what we need to do to stay sober, we wind up not being good, any good to anybody, including ourselves. I understand that. But folks, I cannot believe that AA is a selfish program because my illness is an illness of self. The book tells me absolutely clearly that selfishness and self-centeredness are the root of it, that ego disorder of man. That's what's wrong with me. That's the first thing wrong with me. When I try to somehow treat that by more obsession on self, and I'm awful good at that. I can dress it up in spiritual clothing or psychological clothing so that it's not even recognizable as obsession on self. You know, I've covered it up with so much, so much spiritual babble or psycho babble that, you know, it's not even recognizable that what I'm trying to do is cure an illness or, or treat an illness that is self by obsession on self. I've got a better shot of putting out a fire with gasoline. I absolutely cannot do it. And what that seventh step prayer really asks is that, and it's not just the seventh step, it's every step. Third step prayer says, take away my difficulties. Not so I can be spiritual, not so I can stay sober, not so I can be happy. Take away my difficulties that victory over them may bear witness to those I would help of that power, that love, that way of life. And how about steps eight and nine? You know, it's real clear that the purpose of those is to set our life, get our lives in order, right? Wrong. Page 77, the book says, certainly we're trying to clean up our lives or something like that, but that is not our real purpose. Our real purpose is to fit ourselves to be of maximum service to God and those around us. That's the whole deal. I've got a self, an illness that is selfishness and self-centeredness, and my solution is you. My solution is God. My solution is thinking of you instead of myself. That's my solution. I have to turn outwards, and every one of these steps tells me that when I realize what they really, really say. And that seventh step prayer is clear. Take away those de character defects that stand in the way of my usefulness to God and my fellows. Well, I don't know which ones they are. You see, my problem with perfection turned out to be not at all what I thought it was. All my life, I thought my problem with perfection was my inability to attain perfection. Certainly, I am, I am unable to attain perfection, but that's never mattered. We never get there. I'm incapable of recognizing perfection. You see, here at 23 years sober, if God this instant gave me the power to become anything or anybody that I ought to be, I'd be like a blind dog in a butcher shop. I'd have absolutely no idea what to make myself into. I'd have none. I can't recognize perfection. Another, I made a couple other mistakes on that. You know, the 12 and 12, which incidentally, um, I think the 12 and 12 is a wonderful, wonderful um, book. I think it's a great aid in sobriety. I use it. Uh, if I find any, and this is just for me, if I find any conflict with the big book, I go with the big book. Uh, I, I personally believe, and, and I'm not knocking the 12 and 12. I really think it's great, but 
my personal belief is that Bill was inspired by God when he wrote the big book and sponsored by psychiatrists when he wrote the 12 and 12. Uh, and if there's, any, if there's any conflict, I'm going to go with the big book. Uh, but it's not that I found very, very little conflict. But what I'm getting at is that I strongly recommend the 12 and 12 on 6 and 7 because there's so little said about the 6 and 7 in, you know, in the big book itself. But... But at any rate, in the 12 and 12, and in the big book, where in Bill's story, where it's running through the program for recovery before there were steps and numbered and that sort of thing, it's referred to. What I'm talking about is a reference to a, a great big old piece of non-conference literature. Both the big book and the 12 and 12 refer to this quotation. Of myself I am nothing. The Father does the work. For nine years sober, my brain edited that before it got to me. And what it edited it to read was that of myself I am not enough and I need some help from God. And that's not what it says. It says of myself I'm nothing. The Father does the work. Now here's another deal where I don't want to get controversial. If you're in counseling and you're working on issues and it's helping you, by all means, go right ahead, and I really hope it works for you. Page 133 tells me that God filled this world with wonderful doctors and counselors, and I shouldn't hesitate to use them, and I don't. I think, though, that when I try to use those people as a substitute for the steps on my alcoholism, it's about like taking a jellyfish to an orthopedic surgeon. You know, there's just nothing in there that those people can work on, and it's not the doctor's or the counselor's fault. Alcoholism just doesn't respond. That alcoholism, in my experience, responds to the prescription, these 12 steps. But at any rate, what I was going to say, and I really don't want to be, I don't want to offend anybody, but for my personal part, God deliver me, please, from issues. Uh, over all these years, though, I mean, that's been the most popular psychobabble word in the last six or eight years. Everybody's got issues. Well, I've never, number one, I've never seen an issue that doesn't fall under one or some combination of these three things a resentment list, a fear list, or a sexual inventory. Never seen a single issue that doesn't fall in those three things that could be inventory. Number two, when I've got an issue, I necessarily am looking from my standpoint, me. I almost have got a resentment by definition when I've got an issue. But here's the bottom line. I want to tell you, I've talked to an awful lot of people in the last 20 odd years with problems. And I've talked to an awful lot of people with an awful lot of issues. And I swear to goodness, I cannot remember one single issue that has ever gotten permanently and satisfactorily resolved. And that's why I don't want any issues. I want character defects because I've got something that I can do with character defects that work. Uh, see, and that's the, well, I made a mess, but I usually do. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and that's the importance of, of myself. I'm nothing. The father does the work. Hey, you know, I worked real hard on my drinking. I worked real hard on that, and I didn't get anywhere. And it's been my experience that me working real hard on my other character defects doesn't do any more good than my working real hard on my drinking was. I cannot heal myself. I have things wrong inside me that I cannot heal, and I can't heal them with human help. I've got to have divine intervention. And it turns out that what 6 and 7 wound up being for me and, and are, it's real close to a reaffirmation of step 3. It's coming to my God like a little child. And I used to think that was, uh, of all of the really stupid things in that old big, big book, I thought the single most stupid thing was that you needed to come as a little child. I believe that to be the most profound thing I've ever heard in my life. Now, I need to come to my God as a little child and I need to say, God, Mom, Dad, I don't know 
what part of me needs to stay and what part of me needs to go. I don't know where we are, I don't know how we got here, and I sure don't know where to go. But I tell you what, I'm going to give up on figuring out this pattern. You see, all my life on my own, without divine intervention, the way my mind works is I want to figure out the pattern so I will know where to start stitching. Well, that's fine, except there's one little problem here. Last December, I turned 60 years old, and I've never seen a single pattern in my life correctly. There's not much historical reason to believe that I'm going to see the next one correctly. So I've had it completely backwards. The pattern is God's. That's exactly what the book talks about. The third step when it says we had to quit playing God, it didn't work. I have to leave the pattern to God. My job is stitching. I was told early on that the only glimpse of God's will I'll ever get is in the absolute right man. I mean, this instant. You know, we all assume that it'll be God's will five seconds from now for me to be up here drawn and on and you all held captive. Any one of us could have a seizure or a heart attack. The lights could go out, fire alarm could go on, wet drunk could come barreling in here raising sand, our airplane could fly and, you know, we could spend the rest of the day coming up with things that could happen that would totally change what I believe God's will is going to be five seconds from now. And yet I waste all this time worrying about God's will for two hours from now or next year or five years from now. My job stitching. There's a little spark of the divine and I believe every one of us human beings and that, that's the only part that knows God's will. And it only knows it in the right now and all it tells me is where to take that next stitch. And taking that next stitch when my brain disagrees with that, when my brain's coming up with these patterns and says, oh, that'll be a, that'll be a disaster if we go in that direction. But I know full well in my heart that that next stitch, that is the right thing to do not to lie, that is the right thing not to cheat, that is the right thing for whatever. That's faith for me. I used to think faith was that nice, warm, fuzzy feeling that God's got me in the palm of his or her hands and everything is okay. That's not faith. That's the reward for faith. That's the reward for that really scary, difficult thing of taking that next stitch in the right place when every part of your humanity... And for me, you know, the enemy of the right thing, when I first got sober, I thought the enemy of the right thing would usually be things like greed and lust. Maybe 1% of the time. The enemy of the right thing is fear. And the biggest enemy of the right thing is the fear that I'll look bad. And I believe that's true of a lot of us alcoholics, is fear that I'll look bad. But that's the enemy of the right thing. That's when my brain is going, usually. And so uh, it turned out that that's what I needed to do. Now, I don't read a lot of things other than, you know, it's basic AA material, you know, as far as recovery goes. And I'm not proud of that, and I'm not against that. I've got sponsees that have got libraries of, you know, all sorts of spirituals. I've got one sponsor who I just love to death, and uh, he's always had a problem with materialism. So he decided that he was going to get rid of materialism. I swear this is the truth, and he's told me I could tell it anywhere. It's Billy H. from Louisville. So Billy decided that he was going to get materialism out of his life. So in the following 30 days, Billy bought $1,800 worth of books on how to get out of materialism. <laughs> but, but at any rate, Cherry always said that as soon as he mastered the big book, he was going to get into all the rest of the stuff. And I, I guess I kind of take that, take, take that view, and I hadn't mastered it yet. So... <laughs> I stick with the big book. But there's a title of a book out there that I love. I've never read it, but I love the title, The Spirituality of Imperfection. Because I want to tell you something. Not only in the last 14 years, since that weekend in May when I began to look at 6 and 7 a different way, and you know the 12 and 12 says this is the step that separates the adults from the children. This is the step that weeds them out. And when you really read what the 12 and 12 says on 6 and 7, what it's talking about is getting rid of that self-determined objective regardless of how spiritually we have dressed that up for the perfect objective of God which we can never know, which we can absolutely never know. But going back to the imperfection, 
when I first got sober, and I, I didn't have a spirituality. I called myself a humanist, if that can border on any kind of spirituality, uh, before I got sober. Uh, but uh, when I began, began, and by the way, spiritual awakening never been a mystery to me. It means literally what it says. I'm now awake to spiritual things. I was comatose to them. You know, it's literally what it means. I'm now awake to spiritual things. Uh, I thought that spiritual growth would be a steady incline on the way up, kind of like an unbroken beam. All I have ever been able to do, and that includes today, is stumble a couple of steps in the right direction, forget for a minute or a second that I ever did a third step, that I ever did a seventh step, that there's any such thing as an eleventh step to, to live on get knocked down in the dust, get up, dust myself off, and say, oops, mom, dad, excuse me, I fouled up again, and stumble another couple of steps in the right direction, get knocked over again. And I want to tell you that right today there are some days where I do that 100 times. I'm talking about a lot of it. And you know, for a long time, I thought every time that that process happened that I forgot and I got taken over by self and I got knocked down that it was an interruption of my spiritual growth, but I know now that that process is the only spiritual growth of which I'm capable. My God doesn't seem to require perfection from me. He or she doesn't even really seem to require consistency. My God seems to be just tickled to death with persistence, with just keeping on stumbling. You know, there's never been a day, and I'm going to tell you some things about this last 14 years before I shut up. There's never been a day in those 14 years when I have thought that I was doing the sixth and seventh step thing well enough it work. There's never been a day when it felt like I was doing it well and consistently enough for it to do any good at all. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about how it's worked. I've been married for 13 years now to a woman that uh, I don't argue with. Uh, I don't have discomfort in that area of my life. I've got some psychologist friends that tell me that it's not healthy to have a relationship where you never argue. Well, I'll take my chances. I like it pretty good, you know. And, and in fact, and th this is a joke, but uh, but it's not a joke. It's the truth. What I do for a living is I'm a lawyer, and I've been a courtroom lawyer all my life, primarily a criminal defense lawyer. And if I'm going to engage in confrontation and conflict, somebody's going to pay me. I'm not going to volunteer to have my belly hurt arguing with anybody about anything unless somebody's paying me to do it. And with God's help, I, as far as I know, I haven't raised my voice in or out of a courtroom for 20 years, but, uh, and that works just fine. But, but at any rate, if when I was... If when I was nine years sober in May of 1990, if my God had said to me, Don, I'm tired of your whining. I want you to make a list of everything you want in every area of your life. And this is not something I'm saying for dramatic effect. It's just simply the truth. And I had made the list of what I thought was the best I could possibly have. And I had given it to God, and God had said something like, St. Pete, St. Pete, I'm sick of his mouth giving everything that he asked for. I would have shortchanged myself in every single area of my life. I've had a wonderfully comfortable and sweet marriage for the last 13 years. The month I was 15 years sober, the financial wreckage of my past got cleared off and cleared out, and uh, it, it's embarrassing. It really, it's embarrassing. I, I've got brokerage accounts. I've got retirement accounts. I've got a beautiful home. My cars and motorcycles are embarrassing. Uh, and I wasn't aware of changing anything except stumbling so imperfectly instead of having all these patterns that I was going to figure out and make happening of just trying real hard to do that next right thing to take that stitch in the right place. Believe me, I would have shortchanged myself in every area. The Bar Association, that when I lost my law license, uh, it, it was not a quiet thing. It was a public and loud 
thing. I had always made a lot of racket in my law practice. I made a lot of racket when I when I imploded. Uh, and when I walked away from, or when I was sent away from that, there wasn't a self-respecting lawyer in Kentucky that would have peed on me if I was on fire. And they were right. I'll tell you, the forgiveness of non-alcoholics when we are willing to do the right thing is just the most beautiful thing on the face of this earth. You know, we somewhere get it in our minds sometimes that AA's got a monopoly on spirituality. Lord have mercy. Bill Wilson finally was given by God a way to put it so simple that even we could grab hold of a little of it. Spirituality has been the key to life for millennia. You know, just that God gave Bill Wilson a form that let us spiritual retards have a way to, uh, have a way to grab hold of enough of it to live. Uh, but uh, that same bar association, uh, probably 10, 12 years ago, I got a call from what I call one of the silk stocking law firms. And uh, my reaction was, man, I've been caught doing something. And I thought, wait a minute, Don, you're not doing anything. So I called, and they wanted me to sit on a committee there in, in Louisville called the Attorney Steering Committee of the Citizens for Better Judges. And, and what we do, we interview people who want to be judges and decide whether they qualified or not. Uh, last year, I was chair of that committee. Uh, the, my story that I was so ashamed of and thought would never see the light of day, I've told at the Bar Association Convention of Kentucky and three or four other states, and they give lawyers continuing legal education and ethics credit for listening to it. The, the, they have put me on something called the Masters of the End of Court, and I sit there, I think there are 24 of us. I sat there with a judge of the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals, one step from the Supreme Court of the United States, with the most prominent, richest lawyers in Louisville, appellate judges, state Supreme Court judges, and one little old drunken criminal lawyer. And I want to tell you something, folks. Humanly, you can't get here from where I was. You can't. It's humanly impossible, so please don't misunderstand. I'm not talking about what I've done. All I've done with my life was destroy everything in it. I'm talking about what God has done and what Alcoholics Anonymous has let me contact God and, and truly has allowed me to find the higher power to solve my problems. Uh, I love every one of you. I hope that six and seven can be as sweet and wonderful thing in your life as they've been for man for the last... 14 years. Thank you.